It's about 7.34am on May the 9th, 1980. Richard Hornbuckle drives his yellow 1976 Buick southbound on the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. Of Hornbuckle's three passengers, Anthony Gratis is nervous. The skies have darkened out of nowhere. Intense wind and rain batter their car. Hornbuckle slows down. He can't be going faster than 20 miles per hour. Just then, a blue pickup passes the four men, then a Greyhound bus going about 30 miles per hour. Hornbuckle followed it over the hump of the bridge. Suddenly it wasn't there. The bus was gone. He immediately slams his brakes on. The tires scream for grip as the car begins to slide sideways. Like something out of a movie, the Buick screeches to a stop just 14 inches short of the 150 foot drop. The traffic ahead of the men, including the Greyhound bus, were not so lucky. This is a tragic story of the Sunshine Skyway bridge collapse. If you were living in St. Petersburg, Florida before 1927, there was only one way to get to the other side of the Bay Area, a roughly hour and 15 minute drive. In 1927, however, the Beeline Ferry Company began operating. This ferry trip took around 45 minutes, so it was a substantial improvement over the long drive. As early as 1926, a high-level suspension bridge was recommended to connect St. Petersburg to the Bradenton area. However, due to outside influences, mainly the Great Depression and then World War II, funding was never secured. By 1944, the need for a bridge was becoming undeniable. In 1942, the ferry company had ceased operation as its ferries were confiscated for the war effort. By 1950, Parsons, Brinkerhoff, Hall and McDonald had finished the engineering plans to construct a bridge connecting St. Petersburg to the Bradenton area. The Virginia Bridge Company won the bid and construction began on October 19, 1950. The Sunshine Skyway Bridge opened on September 6, 1954 with two lanes. At the time, it was one of the longest bridges in the world at a very impressive 4.14 miles long. The bridge slashed the time to get from one side of the bay to the other, down to about 20 minutes. In 1971, a second two-lane bridge was opened to help ease the traffic. This was basically just a copy of the first. This span was used for the southbound traffic, while the original was used for the northbound. It's at this point that I'd like to note the lack of peer protection. Astonishingly, to me anyway, the construction permit for the bridge issued no requirements for structural pier protection, even though Tampa Bay is one of the busiest ports in Florida. Nevertheless, the bridge was built with some wooden pile dolphins, which promptly rotted away and were never replaced. Even more astonishingly, the wooden pile dolphins at Pier 1N were destroyed when a 750 foot bolt carrier struck them. This accident took place just three months before the bridge collapsed. In fact, according to the Florida Department of Transportation, the bridge had experienced at least seven minor collisions since 1969. The Disaster It's May the 9th, 1980, at about 4.30 a.m. John Lero, age 37, radios the anchored MV Summit Venture a Liberian bolt carrier weighing around 20,000 tons and about 600 foot long. The bolt carrier is empty, riding high in the water. Lero was an experienced ship's pilot. For those that don't know, a ship's pilot, also known as a port pilot, is a seafarer with detailed knowledge of a port and expertise in ship manoeuvring. They board the ship and help the crew guide the vessel safely in and out of ports or other dangerous navigational areas. The weather was somewhat mixed. The visibility was around two miles with a light mist in the air. By five o'clock, Lero receives a report that the visibility has increased from two to three or four miles. Based on this information, he determines the visibility to be satisfactory to begin moving the summit venture inbound. By 5.34, the anchor was raised and the vessel began approaching the entrance to Tampa Bay, where Lero would board the ship. Lero and his pilot trainee board the summit venture at around 6.20. 
the vessel was on an easterly heading with the wind from the southwest. After making introductions and asking whether there were any faulty instruments, which there were not, Lero assumed the con. He ordered half a head manoeuvring on the ship's engine. It's now 6.30. The summit venture enters the Egmont Channel. The proper heading for inbound traffic through the Egmont Channel is 83 degrees, but allowing for the wind and current, the ship was placed on a heading of 84 degrees. The tug, Dixie Progress, established radio contact. They were up ahead of the summit venture and had been caught in a sudden squall. The squall was so intense that their radar wasn't working. The tug and the summit venture made an overtaking agreement. The summit venture would use its working radar to guide the tug out of the way while it passed. The engine speed was moved to manoeuvring full ahead in order to overtake. The time was now 6.50. Once they passed the tug, the visibility again cleared up. They could see at least three miles. The summit venture continued on, passing the Egmont Key Lighthouse at about 7.06. Not long after, light rain began falling. A lookout and anchor watch were posted at the bow in preparation for reduced visibility. By 7.23, both men were at their stations. As the ship forged ahead, the weather went downhill quickly. The ship's radar was rendered useless almost immediately. When Lero looked, the screen was completely filled with rain return. Lero told the anchor watch at the bow to be ready for dropping and to have the lookout watch carefully for a buoy on the starboard side. The pilot trainee then called out that he had just seen the boys up ahead for one or two sweeps on the radar and that the ship was in the channel. Just after, the lookout reported that he had just seen a boy on the starboard bow. Due to poor visibility, Lero himself couldn't verify the boy's location. Nevertheless, at 7.31, the ship's heading was changed and the speed was reduced to slow ahead to navigate through the bridge. Lero looked straight ahead to sight the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. Then... The bridge structure appeared out the howling wind and rain, only around one ship's length ahead. They were way off course, heading straight for Pier 2S. Unbeknownst to Lero, the near hurricane force wind had changed direction in the sudden storm. With the summit venture empty and riding high, it had been pushed off course. Lero immediately ordered the ship hard to port, telling the men on the bow to release the anchors. They complied with the order, but it was too late. At 7.34, the 20,000 ton NV Summit Venture collided with Pier 2S. A 100 foot section of the bridge roadway fell across the vessel's forecastle deck. In all, over 1,200 feet of the bridge collapsed. Several drivers were on the bridge as it collapsed, and others drove off the edge, including the Greyhound bus, which had 26 people aboard. Wesley McIntyre, a retired Navy man, was the man driving the blue pickup truck that passed Hornbuckle's Buick. He was the only survivor of the 36 people that went over the edge. His truck bounced off the bow of the MV Summit Venture into the water, breaking his fall. This allowed McIntyre to exit his vehicle and swim to relative safety. Search and rescue vessels appeared shortly after Lero's mayday calls although it quickly turned into a clean-up operation. In total, 35 people lost their lives. 26 of them were on the Greyhound bus. Tampa civil lawyer Stephen Yerid reached the summit venture soon after the accident, looking for Lero. His firm, Holland and Knight, represented many of the harbour pilots. In an interview, Yerid said the following, When I went aboard the ship and saw John, I thought I'd never seen a soul so lost. Paul Scotty, a retired Coast Guard official who ran media operations during the aftermath of the disaster, said the following. I still tried to imagine what Lero felt. He's standing on the bridge and he's suddenly blind. He doesn't know where the other traffic is. He thinks he's going straight, but the wind is pushing him sideways. It's like somebody put a black hood over his head and said, go ahead, navigate now. A state inquiry cleared Lero of negligence. However, a Coast Guard inquiry found that Lero's decision to proceed in zero visibility 
contributed to the crash. In the official report of the accident, the following probable causes were determined. Probable cause of this accident was the Summit Venture's unexpected encounter with severe weather involving high winds and heavy rain associated with a line of intense thunderstorms which overtook the vessel as it approached the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. The failure of the National Weather Service to issue a severe weather warning for mariners and the failure of the pilot to abandon the transit when visual and radar navigational references for the channel and for the bridge were lost in the heavy rain. Contributing to the loss of life and to the extensive damage was the lack of a structural pier protection system which could have absorbed some of the impact force or redirected the vessel. After the accident, several safety regulations were changed, including improving navigational aids for ships, adding better pier protection to bridges going forward and installing bridge failure detection and warning systems. The undamaged northern section of the bridge was converted back into a two-way bridge while the state of Florida considered replacement options. It was decided that a new cable stayed bridge would be constructed. It would have a much wider shipping lane and proper concrete dolphins and other barriers as protection. Construction began in 1983 but was delayed several times due to poor weather conditions. The new bridge was finally set to open on April the 30th of 1987. Amazingly, the day before the bridge opened, its new concrete dolphins were tested when a 78-foot shrimp boat collided head-on. The concrete barrier sustained only minor damage and the bridge was completely unaffected. However, the shrimp boat sunk. The MV Summit Venture was repaired and continued sailing until it sank off the Vietnamese coast in 2010 under a different name. Many of the people involved with the accident would avoid bridges for the rest of their lives. If you've made it to the end of this video, please consider subscribing and leaving a like. If you have a suggestion for a topic you'd like to see covered in future videos, please comment below. Lastly, if you didn't like the video, please let me know why in the comments so I can improve future videos. Thank you.